This is the WGBH Forum Network. The Creative Method. The National Association of Educational Broadcasters presents George Shearing on Jazz. Hello, this is Lyman Bryson. How does a composer of jazz see the relation of his music to music in general? Bill Kavnis discussed this with George Shearing. The music is Lullaby of Birdland. All told, there are some 75 recordings of Lullaby of Birdland, but this one is definitive. It is by the creator, the composer, the arranger and pianist, George Shearing. Mr. Shearing, what we're trying to find out is how a jazz musician, like yourself, goes about creating a piece like Lullaby of Birdland. Well, I suppose the same ideas prevail as with the creation of any melody. If it is to be a readily acceptable melody, it uh, must be within the a singable range of some kind. Uh, for instance, this is a melody. <laughs> in that it is a succession of notes. But nobody would recognize it as a melody because, uh, well, unless you are extremely contemporary in, 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 in thinking and uh, it goes along with something. But to get back to the, the basis of melody, something which can be very easily sung, jumps, the interval jumps, are not too great. The notes are fairly well neighboring tones up to there. And when they are great, uh, there seems to be some uh, logic to them, uh, which uh, falls into place with the harmony. And they're fairly easily singable. Jazz musician as creator, one of ten conversations with creative Americans about the nature of their work, the creative method, prepared by WGBH-FM in Boston under a grant from the National Educational Television and Radio Center. Later, we'll tell you how you may obtain excerpts from this and 21 other radio essays on the creative process in American arts, sciences, and professions. But now, George Shearing on jazz, and here is Bill Kavnis. Isn't it true that there was an earlier lullaby of Birdland? Yes, and the funny thing about it is that this one that I have just played took me only ten minutes. The whole thing? Yeah, that's right, from top to bottom. And the earlier one, which I discarded, took me about five. It was a jazz, <laughs> uh, sort of a jazz thing. With <laughs> so... Uh, the reason that took less time is because it's, it's nothing more than a four-bar riff or four-bar phrase repeated. And then maybe we would have left the bridge to the performer. We've just written some chords. Actually, uh, there are two bridge passages, two standard bridge passages. When we get through with the first eight bars, leads us back. This is the most elementary form of harmonic progression that can be used in jazz. We tend to call the bridge a Sears Roebuck bridge. <laughs> but the difference, the essential character difference of these two lullabies is that the first one is so markedly vocal and the other one is, is strictly an instrumental tune, wouldn't you say? That's right. Mm -hmm. And its primary quality is, is a rhythmic quality rather than melodic. That's right. Uh, is this ever really the most important element in a composition of yours? Does the rhythm itself suggest the piece? In some cases, I can't exactly think 
of a composition of mind where the rhythm is of uh, the only importance. Because even here we have melody. But when we get to the Afro-Cuban uh, compositions, in Don't many cases, uh, the rhythmic content is of the most importance. That's just the bass line, and above it we have... Is, uh, it's, it's a 6 8 rhythm. And there the rhythm is the starting point, the, the inspiration for the whole structure. That's right. Well, isn't this an amazing thing, though, what can, uh, can happen to a tune when it's treated in a different, uh, different uh, way? Chuck Wayne did a composition called In a Chinese Garden. <laughs> And when I get to the stand, uh, sometimes instead of saying to the guys, let's play in the Chinese garden, I'll play a few bars of it so they know what we're going to play. And in playing a few bars of it, I will very often play it uh, rhythmically. Like... <laughs> melody with uh, uh, melodic decoration to uh, take care of the, uh, the, the the rhythmic content. And the whole character of the thing changes when you simply change the, the approach to it. That's Freak right. It. In fact, uh, if you were to play me a tune, if it were not uh, too extraneous a tune, uh, if you were to play me a tune, I could tell whether, uh, what type of harmony it should have. For instance, if you played... I could tell uh, that it should have some kind of uh, a modal. Or harmonies which uh, are derived from modal harmonies. Now, you say that, that if I were to play you a tune, for example, you, you would know what kind of harmony would fit with it. Is this... An instinctive sort of thing? Is this something that you're born with, or is there a specific training that, that gives you this? This knowledge? Uh, I think to a degree one is born with it. Uh, if you have an inclination towards it, I think you can develop the inclination. But uh, I think... Well, you can learn it if you have the material to start with. I think so, yeah. You can't learn it if you don't have something there to begin with. I don't think so. Uh, if you do, you sort of tend to learn it parrot fashion, uh, after uh, somebody else that has taught you. Well, how about harmony? Does, does a, a sequence of harmonies or a harmonic structure ever serve as your starting point? Uh, or is that something that gets itself filled in as well, you go along? Well, um, in a number of cases, that gets filled in later on. But uh, I think in this case, the whole thing came to me at one time. <laughs> the leading voice of the harmony yes. itself is somewhat of a melody. Of course, I'm playing it that way purposely to show you the, uh, what, what logic bit, yeah. of the uh, harmony exists, you know. Well, is this 
something that is common in your own chosen field of, of uh, jazz uh, uh, and in the classics? Uh, yes. Uh, the idea of sequence and voice leading and harmonic and melodic logic prevailing at all times. Uh, this is my idea in both jazz and classical and my idea of where the two would meet. This would be the common meeting ground. Well, this is uh, true then of any kind of serious music. I think so. That's right. Uh, that's why when people say, I mean, do you play jazz or serious music? Uh, they forget that there is serious jazz. It's a, serious it's a, students of jazz. A kind of pseudo-definition that doesn't fit the case. That's right. Uh, there's a tune which we played in uh, a movie called The Big Beat. And somebody else, uh, I see Cal Jada, was also given the tune. And while Cal's arrangement of it was sort of swinging, uh, it had a kind of a... this kind of feeling to it. Mm -hmm. And the uh, rhythmic content of the tune changed to go along with that. To me, this is nothing but a very beautiful ballad which should almost be conceived in triad form. is there in various instances you heard yes the bass line and the the construction of the tune melodically and harmonically is far too beautiful to be given uh, that swing treatment the treatment in yeah, which the rhythm is the most important feature I think so because there are many other tunes that do not have this melodic quality and do not have this uh, harmonic quality, really. quality. That's right. Well, this brings up an interesting point and uh, very much germane to this discussion, and that is where do the differences in these concepts spring from? I mean, how is it that you happen to hear the tune in one way and he in another? Do you suppose that, that your own background, your training in the classics had some influence on this? I think so, Bill. I think it's uh, a question of, of a broader conception. I think that if you try to conceive of a number of different types of music, the masters, the impressionists, uh, the contemporary field in classical music, and then a number of j different jazz forms, you will know that when you get a tune uh, such as the one recorded by Jimmy Lunsford, in the 30s, which was called Tell Me What You Do. Now, that's a very simple tune, but it doesn't... it does not have that lyrical and singing quality. So... This swing business is, is quite permissible. And the but rhythmic take a character tune, of the whole thing. That's right. But to take a tune that actually has the lyrical quality, this is yours sincerely of Rogers and Hart. And play it, say, like Errol Garner. and it swings and it's very pixelated and very light but uh, it, ha it just, has its own reason for existence yes certainly. it certainly does but it, it, it I don't think it should exist 
in that particular form, not with that tune, because because of the harmonic quality, the bass line, and, and the... Of course, this is all a matter of personal opinion, but I do think that it's uh, uh, based on what taste should prevail in categorizing music. I imagine, this is just a guess, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that part of the reason for your feeling for a vocal line and some of the influences on the, the harmonic structures that you employ come from studying people like Rachmaninoff and Delius and Ravel, that's, people of that uh, period. That's true, the, uh, the romantic and the uh, impressionist. The late romantic and the impressionist right. uh, composers, because the, uh, these things were so important to them. How about, on the other hand, the influences on you of people like Bach and Mozart? Well, of course, Bach uh, is a great influence on anybody that studies him from the point of view of bass line. itself is almost a melody. Gives it such a solid grounding and, and makes the, the whole structure so sound. And that's right. When Bach writes a thing for two voices... You can bet your life that that's all you need, two voices. Do you make use of uh, Bach's sort of contrapuntal techniques in your own... Yes. We have a, a tune called Moon Ray, in which I use the fugue technique, the melody restated at a higher or lower pitch. unusual in this day and time that, that, that uh, writing in this kind of, of say 17th century contrapuntal technique yes but it crops century. up occasionally I mean in the 30s Alec Templeton did a thing called Bach Goes to Town technique, but applying to it uh, the contemporary sort of... Using jazz technique, uh, we'll, we'll find that kind of uh, phrase in uh, Dixieland. Uh, kind of trombone uh, idea. This is an old jazz phrase. It's a good where, standard sort of... Yes, where we take... where we. Use the, the, the foreign note to the scale, you know. Uh, I want to see more jazz fugues written. I have a melody. taking off on there is uh, actually the blues mm -hmm. in minor with this it's it's just the 12 bar blues 
but it's in the minor instead of in the major. And with this melodic bass line ascending. As uh, forming the basis for the, uh, the counterpoint in the uh, construction of the arrangement. Well, now you say that you'd like to see more jazz fugues created. Is this uh, simply because you'd like to see a closer tie between jazz and the classics or because of the, the basic nature of the form itself? Well, um, it's a little both, Bill. It's a very good question. Uh, certainly, I would like to see a greater liaison between classical and jazz. Uh, most of my life is devoted to this in one way or another. Uh, when we make records, we have a, a, a tune that one morning in May... We would use a, a woodwind quartet idea. Very uh, classical in construction. Now, the other thing about the form, uh, do I want to see more fugues because of the, uh, the nature of the beast, the form of, 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 of jazz? I certainly do, because with fugues, particularly with small combinations and the parts written out individually, uh, this would make for more uh, linear writing than presently exists. The improvised lines in the earlier jazz were not always carefully conceived enough to be... Uh, well, they weren't always uh, the most desirable harmony. For what they were, that they were fine. They weren't meant to be uh, anything classical in construction. But uh, two or three or four voices moving and each voice written, we would have somewhat the same idea as the original jazz. It would sound improvised, and yet it would be more perfect than anything which is improvised because of the fact that it was written and it certainly... Because it is polished, it has right. been worked on. Well, now, this, this begins us on one area that I did want to explore at least a little bit, and that is your own working methods, uh, approaching a tune, whether it's one of your own or somebody else's, in fitting it for your own use with the quintet. Do you first uh, sort of noodle through the tune at the piano for yourself, deciding on what's going to happen to it, or do you hear these things in your mind without having to sit down at the piano? Well, I usually hear them in my mind without sitting down at the piano. Well, then this would be uh, built on your own training, your, your training in harmony and... That's right. Now, I did an original composition I called Kind of Cute, and I heard that with this kind of... A uh, wide separation. Yes. Uh, I, I conceived of that for maybe a flute and a bass clarinet. See? Oh. Either, either this or... Uh, or the three octave thing while strings are playing so then the quintet the guitar and vibes again but in order to avoid that simple type of harmony that we use with the quintet in a ballad the piano now plays some slightly more extraneous chords yes and thicker and fuller and yeah. bigger this is the differentiation between an up tempo or medium tempo jazz type tune and a ballad all our ballad, or most of our ballad uh, conception, would be pretty much the same. But, as we were saying, knowing or hearing one of these things in your head, to begin with, is a product of, of a long and diversified training. What would you suggest for a young person who was interested in going into the field of composing or arranging in, in jazz? What would be your recommendation for the kind of training they should undertake? Well... Judging by the standards of music today, first of all, the well-known top ten, I suppose my first recommendation would be, don't do it. <laughs> but if you feel that 
you would eat a hamburger rather than a steak and be happy and do it, then study jazz and classical music concurrently. At the very so, same time. Yes, so that you do not get a one-sided conception because all types of tunes exist. Jazz tunes, commercial tunes, intermediate tunes that demand their own individual interpretation or harmonic construction. And as we have covered in uh, this conversation, the wrong construction for the wrong tune can only denote bad taste, bad musical taste. And who am I to say what is good taste and what is bad taste, except that when musical logic prevails, the question of good or bad taste is, I think, self-explanatory to a well-trained ear and to a well-ordered musical mind. George Shearing on jazz. And here again is our host and commentator for The Creative Method, Lyman Bryson. I was much struck with Mr. Shearing's term, the well-ordered musical mind, and with his insistence upon the fact that jazz is music and that the relation between jazz and other kinds of music is simply as a different way of expressing musical ideas, but according to the same melodic logic and according to the same standards of taste. When Mr. Shearing talks this way, one has to remember that he is a composer, arranger, pianist, leader of a group. And this gives a good deal of uh, importance to the fact that he says jazz might be better in fact, he thinks it would be better if it were composed like other kinds of music and not improvised. If, a, uh, uh, if an instrumentalist uh, uh, says this, it has more weight than if a composer said it, because naturally a composer, uh, and Mr. Shearing is a very successful one, a composer would say that jazz would be better if it were more under the control of the creative mind that invents the musical ideas in the first place and puts them into some kind of permanent form. Instrumentalists... Jazz instrumentalists, I'm told, tend to resist this, thinking that spontaneity and improvisation are more in the spirit of, of the jazz uh, medium. Mr. Shearer thinks that jazz has a relation to the classics, which is uh, so logically uh, close uh, that this is not true. He wants more fugues written, more classical forms written in jazz. And above all, he says to the young person who wants to be a jazz musician, Study the classics. After all, out of the classics have come the great musical ideas and the great expressions of musical ideas. And if jazz is to be a creative art on a level with the other kinds of music, then it has its uh, sources, its, uh, its basic inspiration in them. Uh, one is struck by the fact that the really uh, distinguished uh, exponents of jazz think of themselves as belonging to the long line of creative musicians, which goes back in our tradition at least uh, to the time of the plain song in the monasteries, and that nothing is alien to him, and he wants young people, as every other of our creative artists has said, he wants young people to be as well prepared as possible and to bring to this creative art as not only talent, but as fine a preparation and as deep a devotion as they are capable of. Next week, we'll hear from a great photographer, Edward Steichen, how the man with a camera goes about his creative activity. Thank you, Dr. Bryson. You've heard George Shearing, the jazz musician as creator, one of ten conversations furthering our understanding of creativeness in American arts and professions. The Creative Method is recorded by WGBH-FM in Boston under a grant from the National Educational Television and Radio Center. Producer Jack D. Summerfield with Lorlin Thatcher and Bill Kavnis as production associates. This is the National Educational Radio Network.